on the title screen that's on your, uh, the title slide that's on your screen right now, you'll see a URL, upcxx.lbl.gov, et cetera. Uh, that is a link to a location that contains today's slides, as well as solutions to the hands-on exercises that we are not presenting. Uh, those exercises are some more complete versions of code shown on the slides today, as well as alternative forms. Those may be interesting to you. Uh, since the slides will advance soon and remove that, I will also be pasting that URL into the chat window shortly where you can scroll back and find it after the slides have advanced. Finally, I want to let you know that for those of you who registered for this event through Eventbrite, you will receive an email next week inviting you to provide feedback on our presentation. We welcome honest feedback, especially with respect to anything that you can tell us that will help us improve in the future. With those items out of the way, I'll turn things over to our presenter, Amir Kamil. Thank you, Paul, and thank you all for joining us today. I'd like to start by acknowledging everybody who's contributed to this project and to the slides themselves, and that includes the past and present members of the Pagoda Group, as well as several collaborators. And also I'd like to thank our funding agents and NERSC for providing resources for us. All right, so the, the design of UPC++ was motivated um, by several um, application patterns. Um, it's useful for other patterns as well, but these are the ones that um, we specifically had in mind when we were designing the library. So in particular, applications such as sparse matrix methods where the data distribution is, is not regular uh, because the, the number of non-zeros may not be regularly distributed. And actually at the bottom of the screen, you can see an example of a sparse matrix where um, the non-zeros are not distributed um, uniformly across the entire uh, matrix. So this leads to irregular communication patterns. Another example is adaptive mesh refinement. And an example of a picture of that is at the top right of the screen, where at certain points of the physical space, the, um, there are finer levels of grids. And again, these aren't distributed uniformly across, across the entire grid space. So this also leads to irregular communication patterns. And there are other applications such as graph problems where you're essentially chasing pointers, which can lead to data at, that's lo located at different processors. And distributed hash tables, which we will actually see um, a, a simple example of later today. In these applications, the processes may send different amounts of information to other processes, and when they actually send the information isn't necessarily done in, in lockstep. And the actual amount and timing of the communication can be dependent on the input data, um, as well as on the evolution of the program itself. At the same time as our application is becoming irregular, we also have um, hardware trends that are contrib contributing to um, the issues that uh, we're trying to solve with UPC++. Uh, in particular, we are coming upon exascale systems in the US, for instance, Frontier is only a couple of years away. And so on the application side, we have those that employ fine-grained communication where um, the, the actual message size is small, so the overhead the latency term actually dominates the communication time. And as these machines are getting bigger, latency is actually improving much more slowly compared to computational resources and bandwidth. And so therefore, we need to work to actually avoid that latency becoming the bottleneck. The other trend that we're seeing in some machines is memory per core dropping as the number of cores um, per node goes up. And so this can force the application to actually do more frequent fine-grained communication as well. So overall, what we're seeing between the trends on the application side of things and the hardware side of things is a need to reduce communication costs, uh, particularly when it comes to latency. And our, we have uh, two areas where we're working to do that. The first is to support asynchronous communication and execution. So that allows the program to do other things while it's waiting for communication to complete and thereby hiding the latency. Uh, 
the other thing that we need to do is even for individual operations, um, we want to try to minimize the overhead costs in the communication library itself. Now we're aware that message passing is the um, the dominant model in high performance computing. And specifically when we're talking about message passing, we're talking about uh, two sided message passing where you have an explicit sender and a receiver. So question um, going back to the previous slide. Is latency related only process to process communication or also RAM to register transfer? For us, we are focusing on process to process communication. Um, but it is the case that um, that even even on node, um, there is latency that would be useful to hide. That's not one of the things that we're actually focusing on yet with the library. All right, so with um, with message patching, there's an explicit sender and, and a receiver. And so this means that the actual metadata for a communication operation is split between the two sides. And it's up to the library to actually match up that metadata in order to complete the, the communication. Also, because of this coupling between the sender and the receiver, we have both a data movement as well as a synchronization. Um, again, because it, it requires involvement from both the sender and the receiver. And of course, we know that there are um, the I variants in MPI that, um, that allow that to be mitigated. But you know, eventually, there is um, some synchronization that happens that, uh, that requires some overhead. Message passing generally also guarantees some ordering that doesn't actually semantically match well to the network hardware. A modern network hardware is unordered at the lowest level and in fact may have multiple paths between um, the sender and the receiver. And so that means that multiple messages may take different paths and arrive at different times. In order to guarantee the ordering, the communication library needs to actually do the matching. And so that is overhead um, that prevents it from achieving the maximum level of performance. So what we do instead, instead of um, paying for these overheads, we change essentially the semantics of our operations to avoid them. So as we'll talk about in a moment, um, in order to do this, we will be supporting one-sided communication, which avoids the need to match between the source and the target. We'll also relax ordering guarantees, allowing um, messages or allowing communication to, uh, to proceed at the uh, at its own pace. And we will also reduce the overhead in the library itself to perform a transfer. So the specific way we'll do that is we will introduce the notion of a global pointer, which is a pointer that can refer to memory located on a different process or on the same process. And that's the mechanism that we'll provide for actually addressing something that is located somewhere else. And then the initiator, whether they're initiating or a put or a get, um, initiates the operation and it doesn't actually need to involve the, um, the CPU on the other end. So it's the communication is one sided, the other side isn't, the CPU isn't involved at all. All the metadata is provided by the initiator. And so therefore we don't run into the problem of needing to match the metadata between the initiator and the target. And there aren't any unexpected messages, okay? And what that means is that because the messages don't actually involve the target, the target um, conceptually doesn't really need to know that uh, these messages are coming in. So this looks a lot like shared memory, even though it's provided on top of um, a distributed system. And the costs are, of course, are, are not going to be the same. And one of the things that makes this efficient is that modern networks actually provide the capability for doing this remote addressing without involving the CPU um, in the form of remote direct memory access or RDMA. Another um, observation is that when we do actually have a global pointer do something that, that uh, the initiator can actually um, access directly without going over the network, then that can actually be compiled, compiled down to a direct load, load um, or store. Um, and this can be the case if 
the initiator and the target are the same process or if they are different processes but share physical memory. So again, that avoids needing to actually go out over the network and paying the overhead of going through the, the network interface. All right, just uh, to provide some evidence um, in terms of the communication that layer that we're using, which is GasNet EX and how it performs compared to um, the M several different MPI implementations. Here we actually see in this graph over here, uh, latency for both puts and gets compared to, actually compared to one-sided RMA, so not even two-sided. On the next slide, we'll actually look at, we'll see bandwidth numbers that compare both, uh, uh, to compare to both one-sided and two-sided MPI. And across these four different machines and three different MPI implementations and two different network hardware types, um, we see that GasNet EX uh, provides better latency than, than MPI RMA. And I'm not going to go into details on this. The details are in the LCPC pacer, paper, which is linked at the bottom of, of the slide. Here we show the bandwidth, the flood bandwidth numbers, again, on these four different machines. And in this case, we're actually comparing not just GasNet EX to MPI RMA, but also to ISIN and iReceive. And in, on all four machines, we see that the mid-size transfers, um, GasNet actually provides significantly higher bandwidth than either one-sided or two-sided MPI. So this is one of the reasons why we chose to uh, build UPC++ on top of GasNet. And also we'll see that the, there are other capabilities that the GasNet DX provides us that are more difficult to achieve in, in other networking layer, in other communication layers. And, you know, just to demonstrate that these aren't only theoretical numbers, here we actually have um, some UPC++ experiments so not just directly writing to GasNet, but um, within UPC++. And these numbers are um, on Cori Haswell. And we see that for latency at all, at essentially small to medium sizes, UPC++ provides better latency, particularly in the mid-range. And similarly, the bandwidth numbers, the flood bandwidth numbers um, here specifically for put, again, in the mid-size, uh, transfers, UPC++ provides um, significantly better bandwidth than, than MPI. All right, so as far as the programming model is concerned, um, we refer to the model as the Partition Global Address Space Model, or PGAS for short. And this involves allowing other processes to actually, again, have a, a pointer to memory that's located on, in a different memory space. And the transfers will actually leverage the network's um, remote direct memory access ca capability. We also distinguish between private and shared memory. So private memory is memory that only the process itself has access to. Shared memory is memory that can be accessed by the process, by the process itself or other processes as well. Another aspect of the model is that synchronization and data movement are, are separated. So we have remote puts and gets that again, only involve the initiator and generally don't involve the target CPU. And so that allows us to avoid the overhead of doing the synchronization for that data movement. Of course, it also means that if we want synchronization, then we have to explicitly ask for it. Now this model isn't anything new, it's been around for over 20 years now, including several languages that have supported PGAS, UPC, Titanium, Chapel, X10, and CAF. And also several different libraries, um, particularly C++ libraries, C and C++ libraries that um, support the model as well. So again, that includes um, Habanero, UPC++, as well as Habanero Java, which is, um, um, in the Java language, OpenShamem, Core C++, Global Arrays, Dash, and MPI itself. Of course, we're here to learn about UPC++, so that's what we will focus on. And this is a library that has been developed over the past um, six years or so at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab. 
so PGAS is the memory model and it uh, it signifies how we can actually access data, but it doesn't actually tell us anything about how the programs actually execute. For that, the model specifically used by UPC++ is SPIMD or single program multiple data. And what this means is that at program startup, there's a fixed number of processes and they all run the same program. Now they don't necessarily run it in lockstep, only at synchronization points do they actually, you know, well, synchronize. So this example over here, which we'll come back and look at in more detail later, um, initializes the library and then it has each process print out their, their rank ID. And looking at the bottom, we see that again, all the processes start the program, then they do their individual prints and there's no ordering between them. And so they can happen in any order. Then afterwards, there is a barrier synchronization which does introduce an order. And so after the barrier, we have process zero uh, prints out another message. And so again, the barrier ensures the synchronization that that, uh, that print will happen after the, the prints from all the other processors have completed. And then afterwards, the, pro the processes will um, end the program together as well. So question, what are the consequences of calling init before main? So I'd say it's not something we generally recommend, but it probably works. It's not the idiom we would recommend though. Now we'll clarify that you don't actually have to call init right when starting main. Um, it just needs to be called by all the processes before um, doing any UPC++ operations. One other thing I want to clarify is that the PGAS model doesn't require the execution model, model to be SPIMD. There are other libraries and languages that have a PGAS model, model but don't actually follow the SPIMD model of execution, X10 for instance. Um, but UPC++ itself is a com uses a combination of PGAS for the memory model and SPIMD for the execution model. So some more details on, on the PGAS model itself. Um, first of all, just what the name actually means. So partition global address space, there's two pieces to that. There's the global address space, um, which is composed of shared segments across um, several different processes. And we often use the term um, shared space or shared memory to refer to the global address space. And as, as I mentioned before, processes can also have private memory as well that isn't part of the global address space. And so for that memory, the, only the process itself can access that. The global address space is not just um, distributed across the processes, but that's also, that's actually part of, that distribution is part of the model itself. Okay, so this partitioning of the memory into, into different pieces on different processes is encoded in global pointers. Um, and as we'll see, as we'll talk about in a little bit more detail in a couple of moments, a global pointer is a combination of the, an actual physical address as well as uh, the, the affinity or the process which actually owns that, um, the underlying object. So this allows the programmer to actually optimize for locality by, for instance, querying the affinity of a global pointer in order to determine whether it's actually remote or actually local to that process. And then potentially do different algorithms or even use raw C++ pointers to actually um, interact with objects that are local to the process. This is also distinct from conventional shared memory programming with threads, such as with P threads or with C++, C++ threads, where the pointers don't actually encode affinity. So some more details on, on the global address space and global pointers. We can actually, because we can have global pointers that refer to objects in, um, in shared segments on other processes, we can actually construct data structures that are distributed across multiple different processes. So in, in the figure at the bottom, we actually see a linked list structure that's spread out amongst different processes. And these thick red arrows are indicate global pointers. 
whereas the thin black ones indicate just raw C++ um, pointers. So we can see that we can have global pointers that live in objects that are in the shared memory space and point to objects in other segments of that space. We can also have global pointers um, that live in private memory as well. And those can either point to an object that's located on a different process in the shared memory space of a different process. Or uh, if we look at process one, we can also have a global pointer that is referring to something that's in, in the shared segment of the same process itself. Now, because this object over here is in memory that is um, physically addressable by process one, it can also use a local pointer to refer to that as well. And in fact, that's generally preferable um, because it avoids um, a conditional um, when, when accessing the actual object itself. As I mentioned, the global pointer carries both the address information as well as the, the affinity, um, which is the process that created the underlying object. Now these are packaged up into an actual global pointer object. Because we are a C++ library, we can actually use a template that's parameterized by the underlying data type. So similar to you know, a raw C++ pointer, except for you know, slightly different syntax. Here we have template syntax where the actual template is called global underscore PTR. And then the data type is double. Now, one thing that I'll um, point out here just in terms of the convention in the slides is that typically we will, uh, as far as UPC++ types and operations, we will color them red with an underline. Um, so um, we see that here with global PTR. So the question is, what's the overhead of fetching a global pointer to a remote address? Is it better to define global pointers one time up front or only as needed? Now, we actually haven't talked yet about you know, how to actually obtain a global pointer. And so what we'll see is that um, allocation in the shared memory space is something that is a local operation. So a process can allocate memory in its own um, shared memory segment. And that gives you back a global pointer, which again, as we'll see later, you can actually um, cast it down to a raw C++ pointer. In order to obtain a global pointer to somebody else's um, memory, some communication is required. And yes, it is better to do that communication once rather than doing it um, um, multiple times. However, it doesn't mean that it needs to be done up front because there are several cases where you know you don't need um, you don't actually need a pointer to um, every process's data. And one of the things that we'll talk about is that the design of UPC++ is intended to support scalable programming. And so we discourage the practice of essentially replicating all the data across all the processes unless that's necessary for the application itself. So the second question is, are there atomic accessors for a global pointer, such as compare and swap? So we do have atomics um, that work on, on global pointers and we will see those um, towards the end of the presentation. Okay, once we've obtained global pointers to um, the objects that we need, we can actually, the data movement actually works on those global pointers. And again, it is one-sided. So to start off with, when the program starts up, the underlying um, UPC++ and GasNet layers will set up the shared segments on each process. And then those processes can communicate global pointers to each other. And then once you have a global pointer to somebody else's memory, uh, the process can actually do a put or a get um, that's one-sided. And we refer to this as remote memory access or RMA. And you know, just a clarification thing over here, um, we talked about remote direct memory access, which is the network layer, network level operation that allows um, us to access remote memory without involving the remote CPU. RMA is the programming abstraction. And it generally is implemented on top of RDMA, but it can also be implemented um, on top of shared memory as well, if we have multiple processes that, uh, that share memory.
Okay, so remote memory access is the more general term um, in terms of um, one-sided access to another process's objects in shared memory. So just a, a quick example, we're not gonna get into the details of what all these identifiers mean. We will get to that later today. But um, just a brief overview, we have some global pointers. We can do a git on a global pointer. And here we have the, the middle process doing a git on its right-hand neighbor. And I've grayed out the CPU over here to end, just to illustrate that it doesn't actually involve the CPU on that end in order to do this uh, to do this transfer. Okay, so this git will eventually produce the actual value. And then the code on the left-hand side actually takes that value and then does a put on another global pointer, which is pointing to this object on the left-hand side neighbor. And that will, again, do a one-sided operation to place that data into that memory object. So again, I'll reiterate that we will look at the details of the of the syntax um, later on. We have remote memory access, which is common to all PGAS models. But then one thing that UPC++ specifically provides that is actually not common amongst these models is remote procedure calls as well. And this allows us to move both computation and also data in the form of the arguments to that RPC over to another process as well. So the two main abstractions that UPC++ provides for, for doing this communication, again, is remote memory access, RMA, which is low overhead, um, zero copy, one-sided communication, uh, between a process and some other remote process. And we also provide remote procedure call, which allows us to move computation to the data. Now the design principles that, um, that the UPC++ is formulated around are those that encourage performant uh, program design. So for instance, all communication is syntactically explicit. In other models, in other languages and PGAS languages and libraries, you often see the same uh, dereference operator being used to do to dereference both um, both regular C++ pointers as well as global pointers. And you know, as far as you know, in terms of our design, we saw this as hiding the communication. So it's not auto, it's not obvious to the programmer that this can be an expensive operation. So we chose to make that explicit, uh, the communication explicit. And instead there are function calls that, that perform the one-sided operation. Another fundamental uh, design decision was to make everything asynchronous. So actually, let me just briefly point to something that was on the previous slide, is these white calls over here. And we'll see more details again momentarily, but those are necessary here because the actual gets and puts are asynchronous. And here we want to actually obtain the values and uh, ensure that uh, ensure that the operation is completed before moving onward. And so we need to explicitly um, do that wait in order to ensure that that is the case. Okay, so communication operations are asynchronous, and in order to synchronize the operation, we have to do so um, explicitly. And another big design goal was to make UPC++ scalable, scalable to the larger um, exascale machines that are coming up. And so that means avoiding replicating uh, where possible, avoiding um, keeping track of metadata that scales uh, on a per process base, basis linearly with the size of the machine. That ends up using quadratic memory overall, which um, isn't as scalable. So both internally in the design of UPC++ and GasNet EX, as far as the internal data structures, they're designed to, to reduce the memory overhead, but we also provide 
Um, in terms of the interface available to the programmer, we provide abstractions such as distributed objects that also um, avoid this unnecessary, replica unnecessary replication. And again, we will look at these in detail later on. All right, a few more details in terms of how UPC++ is actually implemented. We have chosen to take a library approach, which allows us to leverage C++ standards and standards compliant um, compilers. In particular, um, any compiler that is compliant with C++11 works with UPC++. As mentioned before, we rely on GasNet EX for the low overhead communication. And so this you know, allows us to actually run on all sorts of machines from laptops to supercomputers. Um, GasNet EX provides the, the middleware layer between the actual um, network library and, and UPC++. And it also includes offload where the network supports it. The other thing that GasNet EX provides us that is, that is actually really important for us is the concept of active messages which allows us to provide efficient implementations of remote procedure, remote procedure calls. And without this active message support, um, implementing RPCs would actually have been very expensive um, in other models. Another design goal for UPC++ was to make it interoperable with existing programming system, um, either for distributed um, programming or um, just shared memory programming as well. So we use the same process model as MPI and that uh, um, allows programmers to build hybrid applications that make use of both UPC++ and MPI. We also provide, um, we, pr we provide an abstraction for threading that we will come back to later called personas that is agnostic to the actual threading model that's being used. And so this allows UPC++ to interoperate with, uh, we're sit with shared memory models such as OpenMP. And then we also provide abstractions that um, allow interoperation with, with CUDA as well. Again, so in the same way that you can have MPI plus X, you can have UPC++ plus, plus, plus X plus MPI as well. Okay. so. Just another high level, some more high level details on um, the asynchronous communication that the UPC++ provides. So again, we mentioned that for all UPC++ is designed for all the uh, communication operations to be asynchronous. So in the case of something like a remote get, which um, the rget function actually does on a global pointer, the rget itself initiates the operation, but it doesn't actually wait for it to complete before give, before returning. Instead, we give back a proxy for the operation that um, encodes both whether or not the operation is completed as well as any data that the operation um, results in. And then if we actually want to ensure that it has completed, then we need to explicitly uh, do a wait operation on that uh, on that resulting proxy. So again, the operation itself is asynchronous, and the initiation and the wait are are separated. Okay, as far as the abstraction for okay, the question is: Does this mean that the future object uses a buffer to store the message? So we'll actually look at features in a little bit more detail later on, and we'll see that there is. Uh, the future is actually a handle to some to some communication state that does include um, memory space for for the results. So, when the operation actually um, when the when the transfer actually completes, the underlying um, UPC++ and GasNet library will actually store the result in some uh, in some object corresponding to this to this communication operation in the future it is a handle to that. And so doing wait on it um, both ensures that it's complete as well as extracts the result from that underlying object. All right, then let's look at an overview of 
um, conceptually of remote procedure calls. The idea is that we want to execute a function on another process, um, potentially sending some arguments along with it as well. And in some cases, the remote procedure call won't return a result in others it will. So in terms of how this happens, the initiator injects the RPC into the network to the target process. And so there is, um, there is a, a function for doing so. And this, if, uh, in invoking that function, um, the initiator specifies the target process, the actual function to run, and the arguments to that function as well. Okay, so I'll, that initiation gives the initiator back a feature, okay? And again, everything is asynchronous. So just like RMA, RPC is also asynchronous. RPC returns before the actual, the R, sorry, this um, RPC injection function actually returns before the function actually executes on the target. The library does a transfer of, um, of the function itself and actually not the function itself, it'll be a, um, a reference to the function as we'll talk about uh, later. So a reference to the function and the arguments, they get transferred to the target, they get enqueued um, within the runtime over there. And then at some later point on the, tar on the target process, once the, once the data has made its way over to the target, the target process, process will execute the function. And again, the, the initiator has a feature that, um, that it can use to wait on for the, feature, for the operation to complete as well as to obtain the results. Okay, but that feature isn't readied and the results aren't tra transferred until some later point. Okay, so this allows us, this decoupling of, of the initiation and the actual execution of the RPC and the resulting return value allows us to actually do multiple R RPCs con concurrently. So the, the initiator process can actually initiate several different RPCs and have them be active simultaneously and then do even do some local computation and then at some later point, wait for those uh, operations to complete. As we mentioned before, this allows us to hide um, this allows the application to hide the latency of these individual operations. Questions on this? So questions is what type of object does FN need to be? FN can be a pointer to a function, but it can also be, um, it can also be a, a C++ 11 Lambda as well. And function objects, so class type objects that overload the function call operator are also acceptable as long as the, there are some restrictions in terms of what, what uh, data it can contain. Um, so details are actually in the, in the UPC++ specification. So um, we can talk about those offline. Can FN have state? It can if it's a function object. Okay, but there are, again, there are some, some details about that state needs to be transferable. So if I have a function object that contains some raw C++ pointer inside of it, when, I do, when that gets transferred over to the target, that pointer is going to be meaningless. So there are some things that you, you do have to be careful of, but generally speaking, yes, the function can contain state. All right, so at this point, we've talked about an overview of the library itself and conceptually what operations it provides. Now we're gonna dig down into details and actually start looking at code. So as is traditional, we'll start with hello world. And we've already seen um, a version of this before, but let's actually dig into the details now. Uh, to start off with before main itself, we have our pound includes, which includes whatever C++ headers we need. For UPC++, we just need to pound include UPC XS, XX slash uh, UPC XX dot HPP. And that gives us access to uh, most of the things that are in UPC++. For the examples today, we will 
um, make use of the using namespace STD directive. And so we won't put the STD qualifier in front of C out, for instance, or NDEL. For now, to start off with, we will explicitly um, qualify UPCXX names, but we'll shortly drop that just to make the slides less busy. And again, I'll remind you that UPC++ operations are colored in red and underlined. So before doing any other UPC++ operations, the processes must initialize the library by calling init. This is analogous to MPI init for using MPI. And so that sets up the runtime and initializes um, the library from the gasnet level up to UPC++. Similarly, at the end of the program, just like with MPI finalize, UPC++ also needs to be finalized as well. And again, this will release the resources being used by the UPC++ and GasNet runtimes. In between init and finalize, the program can do UPC++ operations. So here we just have uh, printouts from each process saying hello world with their rank number. So rank me is the rank ID of the current process. And rank n is the count of the total number of processors, of uh, processes, sorry. So as far as the output, we see that we get hello world from process, process ID out of four processes. So this was run with four processes. These outputs, these printouts can actually appear in any order or be interleaved on some platforms because we didn't actually have any explicit synchronization here. All right, a few details on compiling and running UPC++ programs. Now, if you're interested in, in installation, um, those are, um, the program guide, the, uh, sorry, the programmer's guide goes into much more detail in terms of how to install UPC++. Uh, the UPC++ team also maintains installations on, on systems such as Cori and Summit. And so that just involves doing a module load to get access to, um, to the installation. Once you have an installation, then the actual scripts for doing compilation and running are located in the bin subdirectory of the installation. For a compilation, there's a upcxx script, and this is, you know, analogous to M MPI CXX for compiling MPI programs. You can specify either optimized or debug mode, provide the source files, specify the um, the output uh, executable. And there's lots of different options. There's several different options for specifying network conduits and, and thread modes as well. As far as running an executable, UPCXX run um, works in general, again, similar to M analogous to MPI run. You can specify the, the number of processes you can also specify the number of nodes with dash capital N as well, the executable, and then the command line arguments to the program. Now for our examples in this tutorial, we won't look at any that actually use command line arguments. So all our mains have no arguments at all. If you have command line arguments, then you need the typical argc argv as arguments to main. Question, can we use srun? I believe so. So, yes, assuming you're on a Cray system, you can use srun. srun is what's used to implement UPCXX run on a Slurm system. Uh, so it will lack some of the UPC++ specific command line options, which Amir hasn't covered here, but there's options for things like setting the shared heap size and things like that. Uh, so those won't be present, but you can still use srun to, if you only care about just spawning the jobs in a particular way. Yeah, and the same also applies to other underlying spawners like JS run and AP run. So UBCXX run is just a script wrapper around those that sets some environment variables and then calls, calls the system spawner. Thank you, Dan. With respect to the question, can you use Clang or GPC C++ directly to compile a UPC++ program? So we do provide a UPCXX meta um, script that allows you to essentially get the necessary options to pass to, to the underlying compiler. Um, so there is a mechanism for doing that. 
so there's um, a couple of other questions. When I use the commands, the UPC XX run fails with an error of does not appear to execute a UPC++ gas net executable. So make sure that you're using it with something that was compiled with UPC XX or at least with or with the um, with the proper flags that are computed by UPC XX meta. Should UPC, UPC++ be compiled with the same compiler as the application? I believe that is a requirement. Um, but Dan or Paul, yes, do you have for, more details? For reasons of ABI, if nothing else, it's that's very much recommended. So UPC XX is just a wrapper around whichever uh, C++ compiler was used to build and install the library. And if you're using the UPC XX meta that Amir referred to, it has an option to retrieve the path to that C++ compiler. Right. For instance, well, GCC and Clang will often use the same backend libraries. You may find that Intel or PGI compilers have entirely different uh, compiler-specific dependencies. They may have an entirely different implementation of the C++ standard library. And so even if this wasn't UPC++, it's very strongly recommended that you use a single compiler for this sort of an application, especially with uh, deep C++ features like the templates and things like that. The, the back end portions of that are not uniform across compiler families. And yes, we absolutely do support cross compilation on the Cray systems. So that you should be able to play around with um, compiling and, and running those programs. Uh, and again, if you're doing it on your own system, make sure to follow the directions in the guide for installation. Otherwise, if you have, if you have a, a Cori account or a Summit account, um, you should be able to do a module load to get access. So follow-up question, a full CMake based for build without compiler wrappers is possible. So I believe the answer is yes. Uh, UPCXX and UPCXX run are just wrappers. Um, there are ways to get at the underlying things that they use and use those directly instead. All right, observation that you cannot use several different compiler wrappers at the same time. And again, we do provide, we provide the UPCXX meta um, script for that, for those cases. So we're not gonna go into details during this presentation, but there is a way, there should be a way to do what you want. Yeah. Matthias, if you're online, can you say a little bit about the CMake integration work you did? Yeah, so there is a uh, uh, find UPC++ uh, uh, CMake module which is which is provided uh, as part of the installation of UPC++ and that uh, module is responsible for finding the appropriate flags uh, and so on and add that to the uh, add that to the uh, CMake CXX compiler. So this should already be available. Okay, um, a few more details on an RPC, and that's just a just a specific code example. Um, here we have here we have a function um, area that just computes um, that just multiplies the two uh, the two arguments together and returns that result. So we can perform this on we can send an RPC to a target process again by calling the RPC function with the process ID, the actual function pointer here um, in terms of area, and then the arguments to that function. And for now, we'll, we'll do this synchronously by invoking wait immediately so that this entire RPC, this entire combination of RPC and wait will wait until the RPC is completed and that result will get extracted into rect area. Uh, 
so again, what we have is we have the initiator actually invokes the upcxx rpc function, provides a process ID, as well as, um, in this case, the function pointer and the arguments. The arguments get transferred as along with a, a reference to the function. And so we won't go into details of what that reference means, but um, I just want to clarify that it's not actually transferring the code itself. Because this is a SPIMD model, the remote process has the same executable. And so it has access to that function. And there is some translation going on in the UBC++ runtime in order to account for the, the code segment being located in a different place in memory than on the initiator. Um, but, you know, essentially what is actually being transferred is just a handle to the function and the, the library takes care of the translation on the remote side. The arguments themselves do get transferred. And so the function and arguments get enqueued at the, pro at the target process. At some later point, the target process will actually execute it and then um, initiate a return of the data to the, to the original process that initiated the RPC. So the question was, uh, there's a question, arguments in function object state can't include local pointers, but can they include global pointers? So they can include global pointers, and I want to clarify that they can also include local pointers. It's just that the local pointers may not have any meaning on the remote side. Uh, but you know, we can con conceivably think of a case where, say, process zero sends an RPC over to process two with some local pointer, and then process two later sends that back to process zero. And then now it has meaning on process zero. Okay, so there isn't a restriction against sending a pointer. It's that we have to be careful that the pointer um, doesn't have any particular meaning on the remote process. It only means something uh, on the on the original process itself. Okay, and specifically talking about the raw C++ pointers here. Global pointer um, has meaning everywhere. Um, so right, you cannot dereference the the raw C++ pointer if we transfer it to the remote. Um, essentially, you know, the meaningful that it could thing that it could do is send it back, um, but it can't uh, dereference it to actually obtain the object. So question: Which thread executes the functions? So we'll get to those details much later on, but just to give you um, a brief explanation is that the there is a particular thread that is considered the master um, that um, owns what we refer to as a master persona in each process and it's that thread that owns that master persona that actually will execute the R incoming rpcs this also means that if you have several different rpcs they will not execute concurrently on the remote um, which means that we can avoid actually doing explicit synchronization in many cases um, by taking advantage of the fact that those RPCs will actually be executed in series as opposed to concurrently. One other thing I want to clarify is that we will see later that uh, the target process um, will at some point need to call into the UPC++ libraries for the RPCs to get executed. But it doesn't need to. Um, it doesn't need need to know details about um, what RPCs are incoming, or how many there are. It just needs to be aware that there will be that there are RPCs incoming, and to appropriately call down into the UPC++ library um, to to actually execute RPCs that have have arrived. So Paul mentions that another artificial example for passing raw. Uh, pointers is if you're using them as a UID or a key um, rather than them being dereferenced. Yeah, so the a, a raw pointer again, it can be passed to somebody else, it can't be dereferenced by that somebody else. So let's look at a version of Hello World that uses RPC. Um, and we'll arrange for this particular version that the the actual code will run um, 
the actual function that's being RPC'd will run just on process zero. So everybody will do an RPC to process zero. And then process zero at some point will actually run those, um, those functions. And so all the printouts are now happen happening from process zero. However, we don't have any synchronization in between um, different processes doing the RPCs. Oh, actually, sorry, I take that back. Um, so we do have a barrier, actually. So the way this code is set up is we have the, the processes iterate over the rank IDs. And when it is a particular process's turn, it will actually do the RPC to zero. And then wait for it to complete. And then all the processes will do a barrier, which ensures that nobody can proceed until everyone has completed. And because the initiator of the RPC isn't going to move past the wait until that RPC has been completed, that means that nobody can proceed past this iteration of the loop until after, um, until after the RPC has, be, has been completed and the initiator also hits that barrier. So this code actually ensures ordering. Um, again, for two reasons. One is because of the explicit synchronization between the weight and the barrier. And the second is that we're sending all the RPCs to rank zero. Um, and so all the outputs will actually occur from, from rank zero. Now, for those of you who have not seen C++ lambdas before, this is syntax for defining an anonymous function. It looks very similar to defining a regular function, except for rather than an explicit return type and name. Um, we have these square brackets. This is actually called the capture list. Um, to start off, we won't actually be capturing anything, so it's empty. Later on, when we actually do capture things, then I'll explain what that is doing. Okay, so this the square brackets um, starts syntactically um, denotes the beginning of a lambda, then we have the argument list, and we have the body of the lambda itself. Now this lambda doesn't return anything, so it's going to be a void function. And its body uh, prints out hello, and then um, the actual rank number. Now this is an argument to the R RPC, sorry, an argument to the actual function that's being sent over to zero. So we also need to send that argument as well in order for the function to be able to execute. And so that's our next argument to the RPC itself. Okay, so this, the curly brace is what closes the lambda and then the comma is actually part of the um, argument list to the RPC function itself. And so we have the initiating processes rank number as the actual argument. And then finally, we have a wait uh, to make this thing uh, synchronous. Now, just to clarify, the wait plus barrier over here is just illustrative. Um, we're doing it here to obtain the right ordering. But in general, we want to take advantage of the asynchrony. So you know, in most cases, we won't actually be doing this, this wait and barrier pattern. As we talked about previously, again, all UPC++ communication operations are asynchronous. The, the wait is needed in order to provide that, the actual um, synchrony. But that's not, again, the, the common case isn't to just immediately do, do a wait. Rather, the common case is to do some other things while this, while this operation is actually transferring over the network layer and you know, potentially executing on the remote as well and transferring something back. Okay, so in order to do that, what we actually do is by default, RPC returns a feature that represents the completion of the RPC itself. In this particular case, because our function, um, and I apologize, there, oh, this, this isn't the same function as, as the previous slide. Um, so, Again, my apologies for that, but the details of the function aren't super important. Um, what is important is that the function itself isn't returning 
has no return value. And so what we end up with is an empty future type. If the RPC were to return something, say like an int, then we would have a future of int. Now, even though we have an empty future type, that doesn't necessarily imply that the future is automatically ready. The future itself tracks both the readiness state as well as um, zero or more values that represent the results of that operation. In this case, with the RPC not returning a value, we just have the readiness. So to ensure that the future um, is ready, we need to explicitly call wait on it, which will cause the current process to actually wait until the operation is completed and the results, if any, are ready um, to be read. Question is, what if I want to return an array? There's a couple of different things that you can do. The first thing is that if the size is known at compile time, um, you can either return a tuple or actually, as we'll see later, you can actually return a feature that contains all the results. Alternatively, if the, if the result isn't known at compile time, then this actually works with um, standard library containers like Vector. And so we'll see later that um, RPC does, does something called serialization in order to allow um, standard library containers to be transferred. Other questions? I would like to add to your previous answer that if the array or vector, if it's something of, of a variable size, uh, is to be communicated, RMA is probably actually better than using the return from a, a lambda. And we'll touch on that a little bit later in the, in the discussion. But the uh, return of something large is not necessarily the, the best use of the, of the features. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Though I will clarify that, um, you know, the flip side of RMA is that it does require having a landing zone. So that's just something to be aware of. Um, a couple of questions. If you do not wait on a feature, will it complete at some point in the program? That's something that you shouldn't do. Um, dropping a feature is usually the wrong thing to do because um, the program itself can't ensure that it's complete. Now, it's possible to have other mechanisms for ensuring that um, the operation is, is complete. One of the things that is beyond the scope of this tutorial, though, is um, the concept that we refer to as quiescence, um, which is basically there are requirements that before the program ends, you have to ensure that um, all the asynchronous operations have actually completed. Now, if you do the usual, the normal thing, which is keeping around features and then waiting on them as appropriate, then you don't have to do anything more. But if you are dropping features, then you'll have to use other mechanisms for ensuring that the operations have completed. Just you know, an, to add on to that, in terms of answering the answer to your question, um, dropping the future doesn't mean that it will never complete. Um, the thing that you lose is the ability of knowing from the future itself whether or not it has completed. It can it can still be the case that if you you know if you lose track of the future that um, at some later point the RPC will still execute and it will still it will still uh, the operation itself still, itself will still complete. But the information that you miss is the program actually knowing that that happened. Question, if a process uses multiple threads, would, R, would R, RPC still be sequentially queued? Yes. So again, we will introduce the concept of personas much further down. But each process has a single master persona, which is owned by exactly one thread at any time. And that thread is the one that processes incoming RPCs. I just want to clarify something about sequential. Um, RPCs are not strict FIFO order the way message passing might be in MPI. So uh, with multiple threads injecting RPCs, there is some concurrency in their communication. What Amir's answer was uh, targeted at specifically was the processing of the incoming RPCs. That is 
serialized by default and, and uh, personas will describe that a bit later in the, in the day. And we also provide mechanisms uh, on that receiving process for forwarding, forwarding computation on along to other threads. So that doesn't mean that all of the computation that's initiated uh, by, by remote ranks has to be done in serial. It just means that the one who kind of picks up the phone and first sees the RPC is done in serial. Thank you, Paul and Dan. And just you know, to add to something that Paul says, just to clarify, um, he mentioned that if multiple processes are sending RPCs, that there isn't any guaranteed ordering. But it's also the same if just if it's just a single process sending RPCs to the same target. There is no guarantee that they will actually execute in that order, but they will be processed in some order. All right, some more details on a future. And again, as I mentioned, it a future track keeps track of both the status of the operation, whether or not it has completed, as well as the results of the completed operation. The example that we saw on the previous slide had zero results, but you can have one, you can have more than one as well. Now the future itself, um, and this is relevant to a question that was asked before in terms of does the result get buffered somewhere? The feature itself is not the result and it actually doesn't contain the result directly, but rather the feature is a proxy um, for the actual asynchronous operation in terms of its ready readiness and its results. And so this means that you can actually copy features like you can any other handle. It also means that uh, extracting the result from a future either by calling wait on it or by calling um, result on it doesn't consume that value. So I can actually um, extract the result multiple times. Okay, and again, it's stored in, in some underlying um, object that is separate from the future itself. That being said, if I do call wait on a future, that does two things. The first is that it actually waits until the operation has completed. And the second thing it does is that the return value of this wait is actually the result that's encoded in that, um, that's encapsulated within that uh, asynchronous operation. So for this particular example here, we have a feature of int, which means that when we call wait on the future, it actually uh, pulls that int result out of the feature itself. Now, wait isn't the only way to interact with the future. We will see momentarily also that you can also attach callbacks to a future. And so what that means is that it can attach another function um, that to execute when the actual um, underlying operation has completed and the result is ready. And that, um, that function that I'm um, adding as a callback will actually operate on the results of the future. Oh, okay, so if I attach a then, can I let it drop out of scope? Okay, so we'll look at then in, in a few more details again um, later today, but essentially then itself will actually give me back another future. Right, because everything is asynchronous. The then doesn't doesn't force the the original feature to complete. Um, what it does is it attaches the callback and then gives me back another feature that represents the completion of the callback as well. But and to so, answer the question that Robert seems to be asking, yes, you if, if you attach a then to a future, you can safely allow the first feature to drop out of scope and if the dot, so as Amir said, the dot then returns a future, but that's not the only way to know that the then executed. So if the then prints something out or sets a flag or whatever, that's a way to know that the asynchronous operation is complete. Yeah, and you know we may see an example later where we, you know, we can have the the callback actually set a flag and then use that flag to determine when the operation, the original operation, actually completed, and that's actually sufficient. So again, just to reiterate, the problem with dropping a feature is that we lose that knowledge of when the operation is completed. If there are other ways of obtaining that knowledge, then we can safely drop the feature. 
and attaching a callback and having the callback do some program level um, notification is sufficient. All right, so a feature lets me overlap um, communication and computation as well. So in this example over here, we have uh, the intent here is that processor is the only one that actually executes this. So imagine that this is inside of a, you know, if rank me equals equals zero, and the other processes are waiting in a barrier at the end. So what we have is process zero is actually going to launch RPCs to each other process. And for now, we're just doing something simple, which is obtain the rank number of that other process. And again, this RPC is actually going to execute on that other process, on that target process, which means that the rank that will be returned is that of the target process, not of the initiator. Okay. So here we do have a return value. And so we get a, a future int out of this as opposed to just an empty future. And then process zero is storing these features inside of a vector. Okay, again, rather than calling wait immediately on them, this allows process zero to proceed to injecting um, the next RPC and actually injecting all of them before ensuring that any of them have been completed. And again, we are being careful not to drop the features, we're storing them inside of a vector. But after they've all been initiated, then process zero goes back and iterates over the features and ensures that each of them has been completed. So this is sort of a rudimentary way of overlapping RPCs and waiting on all the results. We'll see that there are significantly better ways of, um, of doing the wait part, um, of waiting on groups of asynchronous operations. The question on the UPC++ versus MPI RMA results on slide nine published somewhere. So yes, uh, they are in the IPDPS 19 paper. Another question, can we send RPCs from within an RPC function? Yes, you can. You can initiate RPCs, you can initiate RMAs. Uh, the one thing that you shouldn't do is actually do anything blocking within an RPC. So like invoking wait on a future. But initiating new asynchronous operations is, is actually a common pattern um, from within an RPC. Are features local? So that's a good question. Uh, and it's something that is, if you're used to C++ 11 features, it's a little different. Um, futures are not transferable to other processes. Um, so they are, they are local objects. And you know, the reason for this is that the, concept of a feature in EPC++ is intended for, um, for supporting asynchrony, not for communication. So communication itself, that should be done with um, RMAs or RPCs, and the feature itself um, is, for, is for representing the asynchrony as opposed to doing the communication. So how would I initiate a feature in an RPC? So we, what the RPC could do is initiate some operation and then store the feature somewhere. You can also have RPCs that actually initiate an operation and return a feature. So when an RPC returns a feature, uh, the, the, um, the completion of that RPC is actually delayed until um, until whatever operation um, corresponding to that return feature also completes. So for instance, if I do, if process zero does an RPC to process one, and in the context of that, process one initiates an RPC to process two and returns that feature from its RPC, then process zero's RPC is not going to be ready until both RPCs have completed. And so the feature itself is not non-local, it's just there's some bookkeeping done inside of the runtime um, to ensure that, uh, that that readiness happens after, um, after the return feature is also ready.
So essentially it delays, the runtime itself delays the notification back to process zero that, um, that the operation is completed until it receives its notification that uh, the second RPC that was invoked, the nested RPC that was invoked is also completed. Okay, then let's, um, for our next example, uh, we'll take a look at a simple uh, Jacobi algorithm. And if you aren't familiar with this algorithm, it's an iterative algorithm on a grid where in each iteration, the value of, of the grid cells is updated according to some function of the grid cells old value and the old values of its neighbors. So the particular computation that we'll look at um, isn't necessarily doing anything physical, it's just an example, but we'll look at a three point um, Jacobi stencil that uh, in, one, in one dimension that updates a grid cell according to its old value and the values of its immediate neighbors. Now the Jacobi algorithm is an out of place computation. So we have our old grid which holds the values from the computer from the previous iteration. And then we are computing values that are stored in a new grid. So we have two grids and you know, as the iterations proceed, we can actually swap these grids to avoid allocating more than, uh, more than the two grids that are necessary. As far as our data distribution, we will divide up the grid cells evenly amongst the processes. For the purposes of this, uh, this tutorial, we will assume that that division is, uh, is even. For cells that are at the boundary, so for instance, uh, the cell with the value four inside of it on process zero, in order to um, compute its new value, we actually need the value of cell number five that's on process one. So that means that there is some communication that needs to be done um, in order to obtain that neighboring value. Now we can actually store the values um, that are owned by the other pro by the neighboring process in um, in what are termed ghost cells, and for our purposes, we will assume that the ghost cells um, that there is memory for the ghost cells in the actual grid, even though some of our implementations won't actually use that memory. Okay, but again, here we have a total grid size, a total domain size of twelve elements. So each process ha owns four elements, but each process also has space for um, a single element from each of its neighbors. And so each process will end up with a grid size of six. One more th um, piece that's relevant um, to our examples is that we will assume a periodic boundary condition so that on process zero, its left neighbor is you know, the highest numbered process and that process's right neighbor is process zero. Okay, so the grid size is, again, in this particular case is six. And so if we look at the iteration over here, what this loop is actually computing is the, just the interior. So the, the cells that are owned by this process, which start from index one up to um, grid size, uh, including grid size minus two, so stopping at grid size minus one. Okay, so then let's let's actually look at different ways of um, doing the boundary exchange that we need in each iteration. One way of doing this is by um, by sending RPCs to a target process in order to actually obtain um, one of its grid cell values. Okay, so in order to in order to accomplish this, what we have here is we have a get cell function, and this is what we are going to be RPCing over to some other process. It takes an index as an argument, and it returns the value of, of the cell of that index in the old grid. Now, RPCs can refer to variables that in C++ terminology have static storage duration, so that includes um, global variables, variables that are defined at namespace scope or file scope. It includes static local variables as well as static member variables. Since we've defined old grid and new grid here as global variables, the RPC function itself can, can actually name that global variable and obtain access to it. 
And it's actually going to, again, because we are RPCing git cell over to some neighbor, git cell will run on that neighbor and actually read the old grid variable that is located at that neighbor and read um, its cell value out of it. So in this particular case over here, this particular example of the RPC is that I am sending an RPC over to the right neighbor. I need it cell at index one, because again, index zero is the space for, um, for its go cell um, that um, can hold uh, the, the data from its left neighbor. So it's first, the, the index of the first cell that it actually owns is, is going to be index one into its own grid. I will point out that from here on out, we will generally drop the UPCXX colon colon qualifier just to make the code more readable. So, you know, imagine that we had a using namespace UPCXX um, at the top. We will continue to um, color UPC++ operations in red and underline them uh, to make it clear what is UPC++ and what isn't. So then let's look at the full boundary exchange. And we will do this asynchronously. So at the beginning of each iteration, um, each process will actually initiate an RPC to each of its neighbors. So initiate an RPC to its left neighbor with that get cell function that we saw on the previous slide. And then from the left neighbor, we need cell, the cell at index grid, says, grid size minus two. And same thing for the right, but the cell at index one. Okay, so conceptually looking at the picture down at the bottom, um, what we are obtaining is the data for the grayed out cells that are at the that are actually the the ghost cells. But again, just to clarify, we are not actually going to store them inside the grid itself. Um, rather, we will just read those values out of the future when those out of the features when those features are ready. So we're doing this asynchronously. So we're not going to call wait right now. We're just keep track of the features for each of these operations. And then we can go ahead and overlap that with doing computation, doing the interior computation. And so we can't compute our own boundary cells yet because they rely on the go cells in order to be able to compute the new value. But anything that's in the interior, we can actually compute right now. And so that's, that's what this loop is doing. And this is why we're iterating from i equals two up to um, grid size minus two in order to get that interior. After we're done with that computation, now we can actually call wait on our features and compute our own boundary cells as well. Okay, so here I've actually integrated the wait into this, um, into this update itself. So in computing my left boundary, I wait on the left-hand future in order to obtain its value. And again, that wait will actually return me that value that's uh, encapsulated in that future. And then you know, I can use it with, with the cells that I own as well to compute the new value for, um, for, my, for my left boundary cell. And similarly for my right boundary cell, again, call, I call wait on the right-hand future in order to obtain the value of the ghost cell and use that in my update. Lastly, at the end of each iteration, as I mentioned, um, we only need two grids overall. And so once we've computed all the values for the new grid, then our new grid becomes the old grid for the purposes of the next iteration. All right, so the full algorithm itself will have a loop around this for however many number of iterations that we're doing, uh, potentially with convergence checks. Um, if we're doing something that um, we're expecting con convergence for. The examples that, um, that are in the tutorial materials do a fixed number of iterations just for simplicity. Now, if we stick this entire thing in a loop, then you may have noticed that there, you know, there isn't any global synchronization here, which can be problematic because I can have my left neighbor send me an RPC while I'm on the previous iteration and then obtain the old value of the old grid. So basically um, something that's actually a couple of iterations behind 
as opposed to the value that they need for this iteration. Okay, so again, we have decoupled in, in the PGAS model, decoupled the data movement from the synchronization. So this allows process, processes to get out of, um, out of sync in terms of which iteration they are computing and obtain essentially the, the cell values from, the, from an incorrect iteration. And of course, this is, this is a, because there is a race condition. Right. We, we are lacking that synchronization between the, the remote read through that RPC of the old grid cell value and the update to it um, that is done in the, in the local process. And because it's a race condition, this means that we don't know when this will happen. It may not be observed in testing, but may happen in production. So this is something that um, we have to be careful of when we are doing one-sided communication. And again, you know, the reason why we decouple the synchronization from the data movement is for performance. But we need to make sure that if we do need that synchronization, that we actually put it in there um, so that we get correctness as well. So a naive solution to this is to just put barriers at the end of each iteration. And in particular, we put barriers around the swap to ensure to both protect the previous iterations and the next iterations from reading the incorrect grid. Of course, there are better versions of better ways to synchronize this. Um, one of which we will look at perhaps briefly um, towards the end. But the, this barrier version is, um, does provide sufficient, sufficient synchronization. So this particular um, 1D Jacobi only has two neighbors. Um, so essentially, we're getting each synchronization um, synchronizes two transfers. But if we have something more complicated, particularly if it feels something um, irregular like uh, AMR, adaptive mesh refinement, um, one of the things that we get out of decoupling the synchronization from the transfer itself is that we can actually have multiple transfers happen concurrently without synchronization and then do a single synchronization to synchronize all of those transfers. Okay, again, we don't get much benefit here because we're just um, a one D with, with just two transfers. But we, you can imagine um, other cases, more complex cases where there's many transfers and we can synchronize them all at once rather than synchronizing them individually. So the ghost exchange that we've seen so far is using RPC. And one thing that I want to point out is that we didn't have any global pointers anywhere here. So let's actually go back here where we, we actually saw the, the function that we're RPCing, which is get cell. And this is interacting with just raw C++ pointers. And again, that's because we're not actually, um, we're doing the transfer through an RPC and the RPC, the function itself that's being, that is being transferred runs at the target. And on the target, we can use a raw C++ pointer to refer to the data. Okay, so this, again, so this version, because it is pure RPC, we can avoid the need for a global pointer. However, it's not the best version. A better version would be one that actually does, they use as RMA, which avoids some of the queuing overhead with the RPC. And we've kind of briefly alluded to the fact that the RPC will actually get executed on the remote CPU. And so that means we are involving the remote CPU the target CPU in this transfer. And instead we can use RMA to um, avoid that involvement at all. Okay, so in order to do that, UPC++ provides APIs for one-sided puts and gets. And they are implemented using the network level uh, remote direct memory access if, av if available. And also, also um, 
shared memory bypass if that's available as well. The functions are called rgit for, for the git, rgit being short for remote git, and rput for remote puts. We have two different variants. We have a variant that is scalar. It just put, gets or puts a single value. The rgit, the value actually gets, um, is the result of the operation. So we get, we get a feature that actually contains that value out of the rgit. For our put, we're supplying the value, and the notification that we get is just completion that the the put has that the transfer has completed, and so we get an empty feature um, as a result of our put. For the vector cases, we supply both the remote and the local pointers, and the notification we get again is just completion of the transfer, and similarly with with our put. All right, so here we do need we do need global pointers um, in order to be able to do these these RMA transfers. We haven't yet talked about how to obtain global pointers to something remote. That is something that we will um, come back to momentarily. But for now, let's assume that we have these global pointers somehow. If we have them, then we can do these RMAs in order to do in order to uh, do the boundary exchange instead. And so this is where we're actually going to use the, the, the space in our grid for our ghost cells. We could do either a git or a put. The code on this slide is showing a git. Uh, there is a version of the code in the tutorial materials that, um, that was linked before that has, that has a put as well. So essentially what we'll do is each process will initiate a git from its neighbor into um, into its actual go cell, and it'll do that for both neighbors. And so we have the code at the bottom for doing that. And again, this is assuming that we have global pointers to our uh, neighboring grids. This particular um, code here is doing it synchronously, but we could do it asynchronously just as well, like we did with the RPC a few slides back. Okay, so initiating the arguments at the beginning of or iteration, doing the um, the comp computation of the interior, and then doing the weights in order to do the the boundary cells as well. All right. So for oh, sorry, for this to work, we need to talk about how to actually allocate storage, and then how to communicate global pointers to to our neighbors. So in order for something to be remotely accessible, it needs to live in the shared segment of the process. The in UPC++ the standard C++ allocation functions do not allocate in the shared segment, they allocate in the private segment. Instead we provide our own uh, functions for allocating within the shared segment. So for for bulk allocation we provide a new array function that uh, is parameterized by the data type and that allocates an, an array inside the shared space. Okay, since we need, in our Jacobi algorithm, we need two different grids. We have two different allocations for each of those grids. The result of this allocation is a global pointer, even though it is being allocated in the shared space, in the shared segment of the current process. We'll see momentarily that we can actually convert these down into raw C++ pointers. And we would want to do that when, um, when doing our computation. Now, a few more details on, on this allocation process. These are not collective calls. Each process is responsible for allocating its own memory. And so I can actually have process zero do an allocation and not have none of the other processes do that. Um, We'll see an example later where we have some processes do allocation and other processes not in order to avoid replication. Because these aren't collective, that also means there's no synchronization. And in some cases, we may need to actually provide explicit synchronization um, before retrieving another processes pointers with an RPC. 
And ultimately the design decision was made not to make this a collective operation so that we don't need to have a symmetric heap. In order to implement a symmetric heap, in general, it requires non-scalable data structures. And so that's one thing, again, we wanted to avoid in the design of UPC++. Uh, the other thing that we wanted to ensure was that UPC++ is also team-friendly, meaning that you can do things with subsets of processors as well. And that does not compose well with a symmetric heap. So instead, each process, again, it will allocate its own data and then it needs, there needs to be some communication in order for other processes to obtain the, to obtain global pointers to the others. All right, so let's look at one, one mechanism for actually doing that transfer of the global pointers. And this is not the best mechanism. Um, we will see a better mechanism later in the form of distributed objects. Okay, but this is something that we can do with with RPC, which we, we have seen up to this point. So essentially what we do is, what we are going to be doing is, um, what we're going to be doing is we're gonna have each process do its allocation and then do an RPC to its neighbor in order to obtain the pointers to that, to that neighbor's uh, grid. And the RPC itself, what it's going to do is it's gonna, obtain, again, the grid pointers, and the grid pointers themselves will be stored as, um, as global variables, namespace scope, so that the RPC can read it. And rather than sending two RPCs, we need to obtain two grid pointers, but we don't need to do two RPCs to do that. Instead, we can actually have an RPC return more than one value. And the simplest way to do that is to use this make future function which constructs a ready future out of a set of values. So this call over here actually produces a future that contains the two global pointers. In fact, that matches the type that, um, that we see in the first line. And then the RPC itself, again, it can return a future. And the resulting future from, from the RPC itself, it will actually encompass the values that are returned by the feature that the RPC returns. Okay, so just to clarify, there are two features here. There's one feature that the initiator gets when it invokes RPC. And then there's another feature that the target actually constructs and returns out of the RPC. And the UPC library essentially matches these features up so that when an RPC returns a feature, the RPC itself is not going to, um, it, it won't complete until the underlying feature that's being returned also completes. And then the data actually gets transferred from, from that feature into the, into the initiator's feature. In this case, because we're constructing a ready feature, um, there isn't any actual deferral happening here. There's a question, any ghost supported in array? So UPC++ doesn't actually have an, have its own array data type. Um, so essentially what that means is that you either, it does compose with other um, array abstractions. So if you have um, a separate array library that does provide um, something like Go cells, then UPC++ can compose with that. Otherwise, if you're just using C++, um, arrays, you need to arrange for that, um, whatever you're allocating to include space for those grid cells, and then make sure that you do the indexing correctly, um, accounting for those grid cells. I will say, however, that um, we will talk about at the very end, UPC++ does have, um, it, it has mechanisms for transferring non-contiguous ghost data between different processes. So essentially in the, in the multidimensional case, UPC++ provides operations can, that can do the packing and unpacking for you of ghost data. Really good question. Why not just return a tuple of the two pointers? You can do that. 
But one of the things that we'll look at momentarily is attaching a callback to an uh, to a future. And by returning, by having a future that is that um, is a future of two global pointers, the callback itself will take as two arguments separately the two global pointers. If we package up the global pointers inside of a tuple, then the callback itself would need, need to take that tuple as an argument. So either is fine. It's a little bit less, a little bit simpler to do it um, using a feature as opposed to packaging things up into a tuple. Okay, so so far what we're seeing here is just the RPC, which is only one piece of the, um, what we refer to as the bootstrapping. Um, the other piece is, is actually setting the, setting our pointers to our, our neighbors. And here we're, for simplicity, we're just working with our left-hand neighbor. Okay, so we have uh, pointers to our left neighbor's old grid and its new grid. And, you know, in each iteration, we'll do a swap on these as well um, to make sure that, um, that we are accounting correctly for which one is the old grid and which one is the new grid in each iteration. Okay, so the RPC itself, it just does the transfer. The second piece though is we need to actually extract those, those pointers and um, put them into left old grid and left new grid. Now, what you could do is you could do it how we did previously, which is wait on this feature and then extract the results out of, the, out of that feature um, explicitly. However, a better pattern is to actually attach a callback to this feature um, to have that done when the future is ready automatically, okay? And so again, we have this RPC that's being initiated and then we attach a callback to that that actually sets left old grid and left new grid um, according to the results of, of the future that was returned by the RPC. Okay, so because our future actually has two elements, two global pointers, our callback itself also takes in two global pointers, and then we can set the old grid and the new grid accordingly. And again, going back to the question, why not a tuple? You could do this with a tuple. What you would need is, this would be, rather than make future, it would be make tuple. It would be a future of tuple of global pointer double, global pointer double. And then the arguments to the callback would be a tuple of global pointer double, global pointer double. Okay, so a little bit more complicated syntactically, but the effect is the same. Now this callback itself, that produces another feature with whatever the result of the callback function is. Because the callback function doesn't return anything, what we end up with, if we look at the return type of this bootstrap left function, it's an empty feature. Okay, and in this particular case, we don't want to drop that feature either. At some point, uh, the caller of bootstrap left should call wait on the feature to ensure that um, that the transfer and the updates uh, and the initialization of left old grid and left new grid have completed. I will reiterate what I said on the previous slide, which is that we actually provide a first class mechanism called distributed objects that abstract this bootstrapping um, for us. So in the general case, we don't actually need to do this explicitly, uh, but essentially the distributed object will be doing something, something like this under the hood. So in terms of what we've, what we've shown so far in the preceding slides is the part of the bootstrapping that involves obtaining other process, global pointers to other processes grids. Okay, and we've done allocation of our own grids. We've obtained pointers to our neighboring grids. But in terms of doing our computation, when we do our computation on our own grid, we wanna do that using a ROP C++ pointer. And the reason we wanna do that is that so that we avoid a, a conditional when um, obtaining the data out of the global pointer. So in order to support that, UPC++ has a 
local method on a global pointer that converts it down into a raw C++ pointer. So essentially it just extracts the address out of the global pointer. There is also an is local method that you can use to check to make sure that that's some, that is a valid operation to do on this global pointer. In our case, however, since we're gonna do this immediately after allocation, we know that we allocated this, this underlying object. So we, we own it, we have direct load store access to it, and we can just immediately call dot local on the result in order to obtain the raw C++ pointers. For now, we'll do this just with grids that are owned by this process itself. Later, we will see that we can also do this with grids that are owned by, a, sorry, with objects that are owned with other processes uh, that we happen to share physical memory with. Okay, so what we've seen now is one way to, again, bootstrap the communication. Again, allocation is non-collective. Each process allocates its own memory, and then we need some way of communicating that to everyone else. Um, before we can go ahead and do our computation. So this is one mechanism. We'll see distributed objects, which are another mechanism later. For now, I want to go back to the concept of callbacks. We used callbacks um, in our bootstrapping to actually attach a callback to store the results of our um, RPC that obtains global pointers into our variables that. Um, that will end up referring to that will end up holding those global pointers. But we can also use callbacks elsewhere as well. So this example over here is is using callbacks in the RPC version, our first version of Jacoby that did RPCs for the ghost exchange. In our first version, what we did was um, we just had our future for our RPC. And then after we did our interior comp computation, we did our boundary computation um, as, and we called wait on, on the future that resulted from RPC um, as, part of that, uh, as part of that boundary computation. In this example here, we've moved that actual boundary computation into a callback instead. So this allows me to actually basically package up both the transfer and the computation together syntactically one, in one place in my code. And so I attach to the RPC that actually obtains the ghost cell, I, I attach the update. And again, uh, because the RPC is actually going to return that cell itself, the value of that cell, the callback receives that value as an argument. And then it can use that in order to do the actual update for my left-hand boundary cell. Now we do something similar for the right-hand cell as well. The callback itself will produce an empty future in this case because the callback doesn't return anything. And so now this future, which is called left update, encompasses both the transfer and the, the boundary computation as well. And so after I'm, before I do the barrier um, that's used in order to protect the swap, I can just do a wait on each of my left update and right update features, which will ensure that both the transfer has occurred and the update has happened as well. We can also do this, by the way, with the RMA version. Uh, the RPC version here is just for illustration. So another thing we can do with callbacks is we can actually construct chains of callbacks. And you know the the example that we demonstrated previously is I have two things that are actually being represented by a single feature, which is the RPC transfer and then the update. Well, we can have a whole chain of things and have a single feature to represent the entire chain of computation and communication. So here we start with an argit, and then we attach a callback to that to do some computation. In this case, we're just computing the log of the thing that we obtained. And then we can attach some other computation here. So here we're actually attaching a callback that actually um, initiates a put to some other target. Okay, so our computation as a whole is obtain a value from somewhere else, do some computation on it, and then send the result over somewhere else. 
And so this entire chain of operations is represented by just a single feature, uh, feat three. And if I want to ensure that this entire chain is completed, all I need to do is wait on that last feature. And the, the previous features, it's safe for me to drop them. All right, so that was a linear chain, but we can also have an arbitrary DAG um, of, of dependencies for a single feature. So dot then was our mechanism for attaching a callback to a feature, which gives us our linear structure. But we also have a win all function that can combine multiple features, uh, in, including both their readiness as well as the results into one. So in this example over here, we do our gets from two different sources. And they can be different data types. So I have an int for my for my for, as a result of my first um, RMA operation, and I have a double as a result of my second. Then I can use when all to actually combine them into a single feature. And again, the resulting feature is only going to be ready when both the argument features are readied. And then I can attach something else to the result of that. So here I have a callback that needs data from both. Um, from both of those get operations. And my callback here, again, it's going to operate on the data that's encompassed by the feature that I'm invoking the then on. So the int and the double that are contained in that feature. And then I can do some computation on both of those and you know attach something else to that. So here I would launch in a put after that. And as before, I can just do a single wait to ensure that this, this entire uh, DAG of computations has completed. One um, C++ um, thing I wanted to point out here is that here we do have a capture of target because the callback function itself accesses the local variable target, we are actually capturing it um, so that we can access it and we're capturing it as a copy. The question, what debuggers profiler support EPC++? So anything that works with C++ would work with EPC++? Um, we don't have anything, we don't have our own profiler or debugger, at least not at this point. So you will have to attach it to a particular EPC++ process. Other questions? So I hold on. I want to before we move on. I want to add to that. Uh, I'm not entirely sure about the status, but I know that both the Tau and Rice's HPC toolkit uh, have supported GasNet-based runtimes, including Berkeley UPC, in the past. And I believe at least Tau expressed interest in extending that to UPC++. And by extend, I mean in addition to being able to profile just the C++ code. Uh, to have some some knowledge or interaction with the sort of the model uh, and the way GasNet is doing the distributed uh, communication to give a little bit more insightful information than is available just from the from the SEAL process. But I suggest that you check their websites for for up to date information. I I can't claim to be an authority. All right. So I mentioned I foreshadowed distributed objects um, in terms of doing the bootstrapping. A distributed object is an object is conceptually an object that is partitioned over a set of processes. You can sort of think of this like a 1D array with one element per process. Now, a distributed object can be constructed over a team, which is a subset of processes. If you're familiar with MPI, it's like an MPI communicator. Uh, and and again, the, the the reason for doing this as a distributed object, uh, one of our motivations was to actually support creating these over a subset of processes. Um, so rather than using a symmetric heap, we, we have this concept of a distributed object. All the processes share a universal name for the object, but each one has, again, has its own local value. So if you're familiar with co-arrays, it is similar to a co-array, but with several advantages. The data representation, the metadata representation, um, is represented scalably internally inside of the UPC++ runtime. 
We also do not require a symmetric heap. And there is no communication um, to set up or tear down a distributed object. So constructing a distributed object is collective, but it is not synchronizing. What that means is that the processes involved, if they're constructing multiple distributed, distributed objects, do need to construct them in the same order, but those constructions are not synchronized otherwise. So this example over here on the right, we're constructing a distributed object with type int. And we initialize it by actually providing the local representative um, for that int. And so what we see in the picture below is that each process has essentially an element of this distributed object, which is the int of it that it provided. Now we'll see momentarily how to actually use a distributed object. But again, conceptually, it's, it's distributed across the processes. Each process um, that participated in the construction of the distributed object has its own lo local representative value. So before looking at a concrete example, just want to introduce the, a simple computation that we'll, we'll be um, using to, do, to illustrate the distributed object. It's a Monte Carlo computation of pi. And I won't go into the details of the math, math but essentially what it's doing is we um, compute a random point in the unit square and see whether or not it lies in the upper right quadrant of a unit circle. And so that ratio, the ratio of the number of points that lie within the, the unit circle to those that lie within the unit square is pi over four. And so by computing a lot of samples of random points, allows us to estimate the value of pi. Now this is the best way to compute the value of pi, but it's again, an illustrative algorithm for, um, for how to do the distribution. All right, so let's see how to do this with a distributed object. So our first version, what we'll do is we'll construct a distributed object at the beginning. And we will provide the initial value of zero, which means that each process, again, its local representative has value zero. Then each process will independ independently uh, do, the, uh, do the samples in order to figure out how many land within the unit circle and how many don't. Uh, we will assume that we have a function that actually does this computation. If you wanna actually see how to do that in C++, um, the, the pi examples that are in the tutorial materials will show that. But we'll assume that the function returns zero if the point was outside of the unit circle and one if it is in the unit circle. And so what we need to do is just count up how many of those were in the unit circle and then eventually divide by the total number of tri trials to um, estimate pi over four. So in this case, again, our local representative is stored inside of the distributed object. We can actually dereference that to um, access our local representative. And here we do have, um, our dereference is sort of an implicit operation, but there is no communication involved here because we are only accessing our local representative. And so therefore we haven't violated our, you know, design goal of making communication explicit. Thus far, there is no communication. Now, where the communication actually happens is afterwards, we'll do a barrier to make sure that everyone has completed their samples. And then rank zero will fetch the actual local representatives from each process. And you can do this with an RPC, but there's actually a shorthand for this in the form of the fetch method of a distributed object. Okay, so you supply the process ID and fetch will actually go ahead and fetch that process's value for the distributed object. And as always, we get back a future. In this case, we're waiting on it immediately. But we'll see that, we'll see another version momentarily where, um, we do this asynchronously as well.
And so here we're accumulating this into some local variable on process zero, and then process zero um, will actually print out an estimate of pi. Now you may have noticed this is basically doing a reduction. We do have a reduced collective. So again, consider this to be illustrative of using a distributed object for communication rather than this being the intended uh, canonical way of doing a reduction. So in this particular version, we have a barrier in between the computation and the actual communication. But if we do things slightly differently, we actually don't need that synchronization at all. And the reason is because when we actually try to read another process's representative of the distributed object, that itself is an implicit synchronization. Um, so again, the construction of the distributed object is is not synch is not synchronized. The processes do need to call it collectively, but that does not need to they do not need to be synchronized in actually doing that call. And then if I have one process do a fetch on the distributed object from another process, if that process hasn't yet constructed the distributed object, the fetch operation doesn't complete until it's actually constructed and that local representative is available on that remote process. So what this means is in terms of writing Pi, what we can do is we can do all our computation first, we can construct our distributed object, which again, does not do any synchronization. And then we can have rank zero do the fetch. And this wait will not return until the target process has finished its computation, constructed its, this, its uh, part of the distributed object, and therefore made its total number of hits available. So to summarize, one of the advantages, again, one of the advantages of a distributed object is this lack of synchronization. Um, the library ensures that a synchronization happens as necessary when you actually fetch a different processes um, representative of the distributed object. We do have a synchronization with the wait at the end over here, but we can also get rid of that with using our conjoining mechanism. So let's take a look at that briefly. What we're actually going to do is we're going to construct a DAG that will actually combine all the features from each of the individual fetch operations. So we start off with a base case that is actually just a ready feature. And again, make feature gives us back a ready feature. Here we're calling it with zero arguments, so we get a ready um, empty feature. And then what we can do is for each fetch operation, what we'll do is we'll attach the update to it as a callback. And then that callback itself, since we're not returning anything, gives us back an empty feature, in this case, not ready. And then we use win all to combine that with the existing set of features in order to come in order to build another empty feature that represents readiness of all of the existing features. Okay, so again to reiterate what we start off with just an empty feature. Each time we do a fetch of an individual process's result, we attach a callback to do the update and that callback gives us back an empty feature and then we tack it onto the set of empty features that we have so far. And the result of that is another empty feature that represents readiness of each of the features that we've attached. And then since we have this all fute variable that at the end of this loop is going to represent readiness of all of the operations, all of the fetch and update operations having completed, it's one thing that we need to wait on as opposed to needing to wait on everything individually. So just to show you a graphical illustration in terms of what this is doing, is this constructing this DAG to represent um, the entire, comp the entire uh, communication and update um, sequence. Again, we start off with a ready feature, 
And then we attach the results of an RBC plus a callback to that. That gives us another empty feature. And then we go on and attach the results of another RPC and update to that and so on until we have all of the RPCs and updates attached to this single feature, which is the only thing that we need to wait on. So question, what is the order of completing the features on, on this, you know, in this slide? Uh, the, there's no, since we only have a single feature that actually encompasses everything, that single feature is going to be ready exactly when all of the operations have completed. The operations themselves can complete out of order. But if we wait on the result, the final resulting feature, we're guaranteed that all the operations have completed. So this doesn't introduce any sort of synchrony in between the different um, RPCs and updates. It allows everything to proceed asynchronously and still provide us a, a result that tells us when everything has completed. What about the atomicity of the summation operation? That's an excellent question. So the callbacks themselves, and this is something that we'll get back to um, later, is that the callbacks themselves are going to run within the context of, uh, of the thread that is actually, well, technically speaking, of the persona um, of, the, of the initiator. So just like RPCs run, you know, do not run concurrently, um, when, when the actual function gets executed, these callbacks, because they were initiated by the same thread, will not actually end up running concurrently either. So there isn't any issues with um, atomicity or synchronization here. Now, there's no guarantee that they'll happen in order by rank. You know, if process, the, if the fetch to process one, um, sorry, if the fetch to process two and the update, if the fetch to process two completes first, before the fetch to process one, its update will happen before that of process one as well. To state it another way, the dependencies are the ordering that you get is are the dependencies established by the graph. So there is a happens before relationship on each of these arrows, but the, all the dot thens are not ordered with respect to each other. In this particular example, you can definitely construct a DAG where things are ordered in the way that you need. Just as another example of using a distributed object, um, we'll look at a distributed hash table, which is essentially a distributed analog of a uh, standard unordered map. And we'll just look at the insertion and lookup operations. For our purposes, we will assume that the key and value types are string. And we will represent this as a collection of individual unordered maps um, across each of the processes. We'll also use RPC to actually move hash table operations to the, the owner of that piece of the hash table. Okay, so looking at the illustration at the bottom, we have, again, individual unordered maps on each rank to represent, to represent the hash table as a whole. And we will have a translation from key to rank number. And then in order to do an operation on that particular key, the initiator will actually send an RPC over to the owner of that key, of the, of the partition of that ordered, unordered map um, for that key to do the actual operation. So to start off with, let's look at um, our class definition with our data representation. So just for simplicity, I'm introducing a type alias. For those of you who are more familiar with type def, this is doing the same thing, but with C++11 syntax. So we're introducing the alias, the type alias dobjmapt as an alias for a dist object where the elements are unordered maps that have string keys and string values. And again, a distributed object, each process has its own local representative. So this means that when we create a distributed object of this type, 
each process will have its, un, uh, its own unordered map. We have the actual distributed ob object as a field inside of this distro map class. And we're initializing it to be empty. And then we also have a function for, again, computing which rank owns a particular key. For our purposes, we just compute the, the hash of the key and then take a mod with the number of ranks in order to obtain the rank ID of the owner. Okay, so then let's take a look at the insertion operation. So the insertion operation takes a key and a value and it sends over an RPC to the owner of that particular key in order to insert it into its local unordered map. So the target of our RPC is whatever rank owns this key. And again, we have the get target rank uh, function that computes that. And the RPC itself, it will take in a reference to the distributed object, as well as the key and the value. Now, oh, sorry. When we actually provide the arguments to this function itself, we actually provide our own local representative of the distributed object, and the UPC++ library will actually translate that into the universal name for this object, send over the universal name to the remote, and then translate that back into the, the target's rep local representative of this distributed object. And so the end result on the target is that LMAP will actually be referring to the target's representative of the, of the distributed object. And then the target itself it can insert into that. And here we're using the arrow operator, which does a dereference. So remember, dereference on a distributed object means give me my local representative. And so we're doing that dereference and, and then invoking the insert method on that local representative to insert the key and value um, into the target's um, unordered map. The key and value themselves are also passed as, as arguments uh, to the RPC, and then they end up being arguments to the, to the remote function that's invoked. All right, find works similarly. Again, in order to, to actually look up a particular key, we need to send it over to the, to the owner of that key. So we use the get target rank in order to compute that owner, and we send it an RPC. And again, just as before, we're going to be using our local representative of the, of, the, of the distributed object, so our reference to the distributed object, in order to send over the universal name to the target so that the target can actually use its version of the distributed object. And so then the target will look up the key in its, in, in its unordered map. And if it's not found, then it's actually going to return some, some nonce that indicates that uh, the key doesn't exist. Otherwise, it will return the value associated with that key. And in this case, because our value is a string, the result of this RPC operation is a future that contains a string. So one of the results that are in our IPDBS paper uh, from, from this year is that a version of this DHT, which is a little bit different actually than the code that we have. Um, the code that we have was using strings. The version in the paper um, actually um, uses uh, uses character arrays, and it very it, and the tests were done at different sizes of the elements. So here you can see that there's four lines for different element sizes, and the the version in the paper also. Um, does a combination of RPC and RMA in order to do the insertions and um, in order to insert into the distributed hash table. But this combination of RPC and RMA actually leads to efficient weak scaling. And without, without RPC, we would actually need to do um, explicit synchronization and and do much more complicated storage in terms of actually how to how to represent the distributed hash table across the set of processes.
So with UPC++ features, we can do the data representation with a distributed object, and then we can use a combination of RPC and RMA to move the actual updates to the, to the process that owns that piece of the distributed hash table. Uh, more details are in the IPDPS paper. So we'll move on to um, some more advanced details about UPC++. We'll look at them relatively briefly. There are a lot more details in the um, UPC++ Programmer's Guide. So first off, we saw the high-level picture of how an RPC works. We have the initiator uh, injects it, transfers it over to the target, and then it gets queued in it gets enqueued over at the target. The target processes the function at some later time, and then it will eventually transfer the result, or at least the completion that the completion ha that the that the function had executed back over to the initiator. Now we didn't talk in any detail about what we meant by at some later time. The concept we refer to, what we mean by at some later time, is something that we call progress. Essentially, the UPC++ application needs to ensure that the application makes forward progress on, uh, on processing things like RPCs. So briefly, what that means is that, as, as we've mentioned before, where the RPCs actually run is in something called the master persona of the of the target process. It does not run in some hidden thread. What this means is, what, what this means for user code is that the performance is is better because we don't have to provide synchronization. We also the application can also take advantage of that ordering, of the fact that. that only one RPC at a time runs at a particular target. And so that means that we can have multiple RPCs that are actually touching the same piece of data without a need for explicit synchronization. And so the result is better performance. In order to make this work, however, the application does need to ensure that the RPCs do get processed at some point. Specifically, there are two levels of progress within the UPC++ runtime. There is an internal level of progress that advances UPC++ internal state, but doesn't actually run user code. So what this means is that it doesn't make any features ready. It doesn't run um, RPCs at all either. Instead, the level of progress that actually does that, that readies feature, that runs callbacks with dot then, that runs RPCs, is something called user level progress. So this is a question, is progress necessary for an output or argit of a value, or for the output or argit of a large array? Now, one of the things that we talked about with remote memory access is that it doesn't actually involve the CPU of the target. So that means that the application doesn't need to actually invoke um, at least not user level progress in order for that to uh, proceed. And generally speaking, not internal progress either. Um, Paul or Dan, is there any instance where you do need internal progress? Yes, so on high speed networks, that is HPC relevant networks, Amir's answer is 100% correct. In the case of our portable network conduits, that is implementation over MPI or over UDP, which might be relevant on a system with an unsupported network or when running on a laptop or workstation, uh, progress is needed because you need to pull those. They do not have the RDMA capability we referred to. So if you want a fully portable application that does run universally, it may be necessary to make internal progress to ensure that the RGET and the RPUT uh, do actually advance. So for user level progress, in all cases, we actually, the application does need to ensure that that happens. And for an internal level, uh, it depends on what the underlying network supports. So as far as invoking user level progress, 
we provide a progress function and this function can also be used for internal level progress um, for portable applications in, that need to run on networks that don't support RDMA. And a program can invoke progress directly, but also blocking calls ensure user level progress as well. So waiting on a future will invoke user level progress, which means that um, it will actually um, invoke the underlying code to ready features and to run callbacks and to run incoming RPCs. And something like a barrier, which is also a blocking call, will do the same as well. So in many applications, actually, you don't need to explicitly call progress because you have a wait or a barrier in there that ensures that uh, the application does user level progress. In other applications, if you don't have a wait or a barrier, and you are expecting local callbacks or incoming RPCs to execute, then you would need explicit calls to progress in there to ensure that that happens. In this case, however, the, the progress function, by providing the progress function, we allow the, the application to decide how much time to devote to, devote to progress and how much time to devote uh, to just local computation. So question, will progress be called if we call wait on a feature that it is immediately ready? So, you know, the, the last um, bullet point is actually relevant here, which is that calling progress doesn't guarantee that, that, um, that anything will actually be run. Invoking user level progress executes some number of um, outstanding um, completion actions, but that some number can be zero as well. So this would be the case where that number is likely to be zero. So let's take a brief look at this example. There's a lot of details in this example that aren't really relevant, so I don't want to spend time on that. But just at a high level, rather than doing a barrier synchronization, um, essentially what this code does is point-to-point -point synchronization through a flag. So the this does a, a boundary exchange and as part of that boundary exchange it also updates a flag to indicate that the data has arrived. Um, and so because we don't have the a weight or a barrier here, the application does need to invoke progress to ensure that you know, the incoming RPC, which is actually going to be updating the flag, does eventually execute. And then the flag gets updated. And so then we can receive notification that um, uh, the application can tell that the, that the transfer has completed. Without the call to progress, essentially, if this was just a while flag phase is not equal to step I with an empty body, then the incoming RPC actually won't execute ever. And so the code would actually deadlock. So again, the call to progress here um, will at some point, when the incoming RPCs that actually that is actually going to modify that, uh, that flag um, arrives, it will actually run it so that uh, this code can break out of the loop. All right, for the rest of my time before we actually um, look at our application case studies. Um, I'd like to give you a brief overview of some of the other features that we haven't had, we won't have time to go into detail um, in UPC++. So UPC++ supports, supports remote atomic operations and our abstraction for that is something called an atomic domain. The atomic domain is specified over a data type and an operation set. And if the network hardware supports the operations that the domain specifies, that are specified for the domain, then this can all be offloaded uh, to the network hardware. And so the domain allows um, the operations on the domain to be, to actually be done safely by either choosing offloading or doing it on the CPU, depending on what operations are required and what the network hardware supports.
the operations themselves, they can be done remotely. They are on global pointers. So you can both run these atomics on some piece of data that's that's in your own shared memory or in some other processes processes shared memory as well. Just one brief comment, which is, you know, we've seen that with RPCs, we can, because they are, um, they are not executed concurrently at the target, um, we can actually get something similar to atomics there, but that does involve the CPU because it is the CPU that's going to process the RPC. With an atomic domain, if our network hardware supports these set of operations, then that can be completely offloaded off the CPU. So another thing that um, the UPC++ supports is the ability to ship over data. We've seen that through RPC, that RPC ships over data to the other end. And you know the examples that we've looked at have used either primitive types, like int or double, or distributed objects, which as we mentioned, actually involves translating to the universal name, sending over the universal name, and then translating back to the local representative of the distributed object. UPC++ actually provides a more general serialization mechanism where for C compatible types or standard layout types, as would be said in C++, it actually does a byte transfer, but for more complex types, it actually can do a different translation uh, from memory into bytes on the network. And so we have built-in support for many standard library types, including vectors, including strings, um, as we saw in the distributed hash table, table example, maps, and so on. Now, one of the downsides to doing this is that if you do serialize something like a vector, it does need to be constructed on the other end. So the vector get, gets translated into bytes, the bytes get transferred over to the other side into a network buffer, and then, then a vector actually needs to be constructed on the remote side out of the data inside the network buffer. So that involves a copy at the target. There are cases where we don't want a copy and instead want to just process the data directly from the network buffer. And we actually have a mechanism for doing that. It's called a view. So a view is, as the name implies, a non-owning view into an existing sequence of elements. And so the initiator can construct a view over some standard library type like a vector. And that's a cheap operation uh, because it doesn't copy data uh, when constructing that view. The transfer itself will copy data and the results will arrive in some net network buffer on the target. And then rather than actually constructing a standard library container out of that, the target RPC can actually, actually receives a view onto the network buffer itself. And then it can actually do the computation directly on the network, on the data in the network buffer without needing to copy it out of the network buffer. All right, previously we alluded to the fact that you can have multiple processes that share memory and that you can have a global pointer to another process, to another process's memory, but that you actually share physical memory with that process. And the reason this is the case is because machines are actually hierarchical structures. And you can have multiple processes that are on the same node and therefore can share physical memory. UPC plus plus actually exposes this hierarchy um, in the form of a local team. So the local team is a team corresponding to all the processes in the physical uh, memory space, the physical node um, where the current process is located. And so UPC++ actually supports sharing of, of the physical memory between the, of the shared segment 
portion of the physical memory between these processes so that everyone in the local team can actually do direct load store to everyone else's shared segment. Because all of those processes, again, have direct load store access to the shared seg segment of the other processes in the local team, if one of them has a global pointer to another, an object on that's owned by another member of the local team, it can actually downcast it into a raw C++ pointer and then work with it directly. And so a common optimization for avoiding um, replicated data is to just have a single process on each node do the allocation and then send that out to everyone else in the same local team. Okay, so briefly what that looks like is um, we start off by obtaining the, the rank ID in the local team. So if we call local team, we get back a team object and then we can actually look up our rank inside of that local team. And then we can have just the process whose rank is zero within that local team do the allocation of a data structure and then send it out through this broadcast operation to everyone else in the local team. And then everyone else, once they receive that data, once they receive that global pointer, can cast it down into a local pointer and then directly access that memory. So the, the picture that you, we end up with is at the bottom. Again, we have our data structure. We only have one copy per local team as opposed to per individual process. And then each of the processes actually have raw C++ pointers to, the, to, the, to that data structure uh, for that team. So the upshot is that by exposing this concept of the hierarchy with local team, it allows an application to optimize co-located processes in two different ways. One is what we actually demonstrated, which, well, what we demonstrated in terms of memory allocation, which is having only one, uh, if, we have, if we need all the processes to have access to some replicated data, we don't need to have one copy per process. We can just have one copy per node. And then used, use the pattern on the previous slide to provide everyone else with access to the copy that's on their node. The other way an application can optimize is even if there is data that's owned on different processes within the same node, they don't need to go out to the network in order to actually access it. Instead, they can obtain a global pointer, cast it down to a local pointer, and then just do direct load store access to that other process's object and avoid going out through the network layer entirely. All right, then a brief note on personas. I've already mentioned this before in response to questions. But the, the idea is that we don't want to mandate a particular threading model in UPC++. Rather, we design it to interoperate with, um, with many different threading models. And the way we've done that is we've packaged up all the state that would normally be thread specific into an object called a persona. And then we create a default persona implicitly for each thread, but the application itself can also create additional personas and then you know, transfer them between threads as needed. We also create one additional uh, non-default persona that is attached to the thread that invokes init. And we call that the master persona. And this is the one that's going to actually process incoming RPCs. And so again, this ensures that those RPCs are processed, um, are not concurrently processed so that they're processed uh, serially to avoid uh, synchronization. Initially, the master persona is, again, is attached to the thread that invokes init, but you could actually pass the master persona to a different thread um, if you wanted to, if you needed to. So again, we're decoupling sort of the, the thread model from the actual UPC++ level state um, that corresponds to 
um, the communication state owned by a thread. All right, a couple more features that I just wanted to mention briefly. We don't have time to go into detail. Uh, the first is that UPC++ has support for um, working with GPU storage um, with CUDA. And so we have global pointers that, that can actually refer to memory that's located in either a local or a remote GPU. We also support transfers that can be between uh, GPU memory and host memory, either located in the local process or on a remote process. So essentially every combination is supported. Uh, local host to remote GPU, um, local GPU to remote GPU, uh, local GPU to remote host. It's also mentioned before that we support non-contiguous um, transfers as well for things like um, multi-dimensional boundary exchanges. And so we we actually have three different APIs that balance the between the metadata size versus the generality they support. Uh, the most general is the irregular case where you supply um, a set of pointers and lengths. The middle case is the length is fixed and you just supply pointers um, for different pieces. And then we have the most restricted case, but also um, the, uh, the most efficient case, um, which is um, specifying multi-dimensional strides over multiple, multiple dimensions. And so this is a, what you could use to do a, a ghost exchange in uh, multi-dimensional uh, Jacobi. The question is, are there data structures that take advantage? So we don't actually provide our own um, multi-dimensional array abstraction. However, you can build that on top of um, on top of uh, these non-contiguous RMAs. As far as a distributed vector, so if you just need, if that's something that you can build with distributed objects. Again, we saw the distributed hash table example where we had an unordered map per process. You could build a distributed um, vector that has a standard vector per process. So those are things that you can build um, relatively easily over distributed objects. So I'll mention that um, there were a couple of advanced concepts that we skipped over in the interest of time. They are in the slides and also discussed in more detail in the programmer's guide. Uh, specifically, we didn't talk about um, local procedure calls between personas, and we also didn't talk about the different variants of completion that there are, um, both in terms of uh, things other than futures to perform actions upon completion of an operation, as well as um, different completion events for the same operation. So for instance, you know, when the source buffer is ready to be reused, when the entire transfer has completed, and also um, the combination of doing a transfer and an RPC on the remote end. So there are, again, there are some slides in here that you can look at on your own, but there's also more detail in the programmer's guide. All the tut tutorial materials are available at the link. This is the same link that was pa pasted by Paul into the chat. And there's many other resources on the main UPC++ website, um, including the programmer's guide and the full UPC++ specification, the various UPC++ pub publications, and extras um, repository with, with some extensions and, and further examples. And of course, how to contact the UPC++ team um, to get support.